All right, hey guys, what's going on? So today we're going to be talking about Gaussian curvature. Before we get into this topic, again, this is within the topic of uh, differential geometry and forms. Make sure to hit that like and subscribe button. If you like this kind of content, you can visit my Patreon page where you will be getting exclusive content and early content. Now let's get into the topic. So today we are going over Gaussian curvature. Gaussian curvature, this is gonna be a short video where we just wanna introduce ourselves exactly to what exactly Gaussian curvature is and how exactly we're gonna quantify it later in other in, uh, following videos. So we wanna recall that uh, what we had gone over so far is the concept of this deficit, right? I like to call it a deficit. Uh, these constants here are sort of the proxies for that deficit angle, okay? So in the case of spherical curvature, it was related to a positive value of one over the radius squared of the sphere. And in a, the hyperbolic case, what we made an argument for was it being uh, the, this kappa again uh, is was the negative of one over the radius of a hyperbolic object, right? So we ha still don't really know exactly conceptually what the radius of a hyperbolic thing would be, but we're going to get to that in subsequent videos, okay? For right now, we're just saying one's positive and the other one's negative, and that's how we're going to define spherical curvature uh, as opposed to hyperbolic curvature. All right, we want to recall a few, this concept here, right? This came from the idea that epsilon uh, was related to was related to the area uh, times kappa, right? This was from an, the earlier video we talked about, and I'll just erase that just to make things a little less, a little bit more clear. But we divide both sides by the area, we divide both sides by the area, and we get another definition of this kappa value, and we can actually interpret this physically as the angular excess per unit area, okay? Now this is a little bit weird to think about, but if you think about, say, an area, and there's an angle that sort of subtends that area, the, I sort of like to think of it, again, as the deficit, right? The deficit from flatness, or how much you deviate from flatness. This is, um, this is how this is, it's sort of, uh, defined in other textbooks, right? The textbook I'm largely going by, again, I don't think I mentioned this in the first video, is Visual Differential, Visual, uh, Differential Geometry and Forms by Tristan Needham. This is a really good book. I would totally recommend getting this book, uh, but this is the one we're going over, okay? And this is how they define it in the book as well. So kappa is a number that can um, place that you can place anywhere on a sphere. It's just a number. The, and the larger the magnitude of this number, the more curved the surface is at this point. So we can imagine zooming, we can imagine a curvature, uh, an area. Right? So we have an area and we want to know what the deficit is per unit area of, say, this whole thing is here. As we shrink the area, right, as we shrink the area and maintain angles, Right, we maintain angles. We can shrink this all the way down to a point or an infinitesimal point, infinitesimal point, uh, in which we could place one number, much like you do with calculus. Right, in calculus, you're when you take the derivative, right, you are shrinking things down to a point, and you're asking what's the tangent of, um, uh, what's the tangent of the curve at that point and the tangent has a magnitude to it, right? The magnitude is the slope. Similarly, the magnitude that we could put on a curved object is going to be this kappa number, right? So it's not really gonna be a slope. It's gonna be more of an angular excess on that point, okay? And this is what we have right here, angular excess per unit area at point P. And so we can define this again, if this is the formula for kappa, kappa at p is going to be the limit of this as uh, the triangle, right? So this is the area of the triangle on a sphere. So this delta is actually 
tri- like actually the actual triangle we're looking at as this shrinks down to a point okay so a kappa of p goes down to a point at p this is a this is a really informal way of thinking about it but i sort of like to think about it this way where you have to start with a triangle and you go down to a point okay and this is going to be some number that tells you what the angular excess is at that point let's do a little bit of math now because this is um this is going to help us in deriving other formulas so let's look at this picture here for a second so what we were going to what we're going to do i'm just going to get to the punchline really quick there is something called Gaussian curvature in terms of a deficit circumference, okay? This is what the equation is, right? So we have a circumference instead of an, uh, an angle, right? So we can actually define angular excess, or we can actually define how much something deviates from flatness. Uh, just given, we, we can say how much the angle deviates, we could say how much a circumference deviates, we can say how much... Um, and what we're going to do, we're going to have circumference, and we're also going to have a formula for the area, so how much an area deviates from flatness as well. And what we're going to do is we're going to derive the formula for circumference, and we're just going to say, here's the formula for the area, because that's going to be a little bit harder to derive. We're going to need to derive that later. And then we're going to go over the local uh, Gauss bonnet theorem at the end of this video, uh, which is good, just going to top things off before we get on to the next video. But anyways, let's define rho here <coughs> as the um, as the uh, uh, the radius from this point as we so suppose this is the center here. This is the center of our sphere and this is the radius, okay? This is also a radius. Rho here is the radius from this point to the sphere, to the edge of the sphere. And we have an angle right here, okay? And then this R here is going to be related to the uh, angle uh, subtended on the surface here. So rho is R sine of this, right? So the sine is going to be this. Uh, and the, here is R, okay, or here, no, this is R, right? So R is right here, I'll label that. Okay. Ooh. So uh, opposite over hypotenuse is going to give us an angle, so that's this right here. Right, so opposite over hypotenuse here, I just multiplied both sides by R. And then we have the angle is is related to little r divided by big r so the dis so the radius times this is here's that angle okay so th that's how this is related we're going to combine these two now when we combine these two uh for we want to define something called the circumference right so the circumference is this right here okay if this is the circumference, right, so uh, of this circle, right, so the r, the radius of this circle is rho, so 2 pi r, 2 pi rho, and then we say 2 pi rho we said was equal to this, okay, so we're plugging that in, and then this we said was equal to this, so this is the formula for our circumference, where r is some distance away from P, all right? So remember, P is up here. R is some distance away from P, okay? Just as the curvature governs the angle deficit of a triangle from pi, as we've seen before, it also governs the deficit in a circumference of the circle. And that's going to be the circumference right here, okay? All right, so let's take a look at how this works. So the ingredients we're going to need, again, are the formula we have for our deficit angle, that's epsilon, and then the formula we just derived for the circumference. 
Right, we want to keep in mind the Taylor series for sine, it looks like this, if this was our, our variable inside the sine function. So that's what this is going to be. So this is the Taylor series. Taylor series. By approximation, we can take, we can add both sides of the of this to this equation. We can add this to both sides of the equation. We can all ignore all higher order terms from here on out. So we're going to ignore ignore these terms these higher order terms uh, because um, and if r is large or if r is even any number that when you uh, fifth root that denominator and then seventh root that I'm not denominator or not root but I, I, if you take to the fifth power and the, or take to the seventh power or the ninth power this denominator is just going to get really really small similarly this is going to get really small right so we're going to say the, these extra terms are here we're just going to ignore them they play negligible effect on uh, what we're going to use or what we're going to use later and so here again so this is what we get we subtract both the, this but from both sides but because there's a minus right here we add we multiply by a negative right and that's why this is positive as well <clears throat> okay so now what we want to do so, so here is what we have right here we're going to multiply this by 2 pi big r and what we get is 2 pi uh, r right so these two r's are going to cancel and we get this this guy right here and then we get this times this, which is right here. Okay, so this, so if we're multiplying this by 2r, we have to multiply this by 2r. All right, so that's what we're doing right here. So this is approximately equal to this. And this here is equal to this, right? Because 2 and 6 cancel the pi. Here's the pi r. It's going to cancel with one of the r's, so it's going to be r squared down here. And we're going to have that little r cubed. Okay. And then we get 1 over r squared. That's kappa. All right, so that's, there's our kappa. And then pi r cubed over 3. All right. So what we get is this. So we multiply this by 2 pi r. And we all, we all get that this is equal to this, right? So which is right here. Okay, so we, now we can define kappa in terms of the circumference rather than the epsilon, which is the angle. And this is the formula we have, right? Multiply both sides by 3, divide both sides by pi. This here, so this is your typical circumference equation, right? So the circumference of some radius r, right, of this radius right here, if things were flat, right? If things were flat, then our circle would look something like this. Right, it feels flat, but since it's on a curved space, we need to take into account um, that curvature as well. Okay. So these points here are getting dragged down to these. This point here is getting dragged down to this point. So we need to, we're sort of we're calculating what that circumference is when we drag those points down. And that is going to be, uh, that's going to be, so here, here it is when it's flat, this is that correction, right? So this is what's taking into account the correction. So C of R is this, right? So big, so big R, big R again is right here. And depending on what little r is, is going to tell us how much of how much curvature we're going to need to correct for. Okay, so that's where the, the this is where that correction comes into play. And then we have little r again. That's going to be down here. And then we have just constants out here. So this is the Gaussian curvature in terms of the deficit circumference. We can do the same thing uh, for deficit area. And this is what that equation looks like right now. We're not going to derive it right now. We will later. We're just not going to derive it right now because there's a few extra things that we need to 
take it, we need to learn before we derive this equation. But we're, I'm just going to show it to you for right now and tell you that this these are universal for spherical surfaces. Okay, the equations that we developed uh, so far now are deficit angle in terms of circumference, in terms of def or the deficit in terms of angle, in terms of circumference, and now in terms of area. Okay, the point here is that k is just a number and it determines the intrinsic geometry of the surface, the, the surface. And that intrinsic geometry, again, is given by some deficit, right? You start off with flatness, and then you measure how much away from flatness these things become. So now let's talk about the local Gauss bonnet theorem. This is just going to be really short. I kind of want to just briefly introduce this to you guys before we get more into it later. So this theorem states that the angular excess of such a triangle is simply the total circumference inside of it. So the angular excess of such a triangle on a curved surface is simply the total circumference inside of it. So let's take a look at what this looks like from a pictorial standpoint. We start with epsilon. This is our, our angle deficit of some triangle. And what we've what we've defined this as was the angle sum of the triangle. So the total internal sum of that, the angles in that triangle on a surface minus pi. And this is on radians. So this is minus from flatness, right? So I will label, so this pi again is flat. Uh, that's what gives us the, that's what we start with flat and then anything above or below flat is going to give us that, that, that deficit. We can sort of put this in more calculus terms and we could say the double derivative or the double integral, sorry, of the, of kappa, right? Because remember, epsilon is equal to kappa times the area. The area is dx dy, so we need two integ integrals one going over dx, one going over dy, of the triangle on that surface, and this is what we're integrating, okay? So from a, picture, from a pictorial standpoint, or a pictorial standpoint, we have some surface. This could be some curved surface, and this curved surface, however, uh, has, we can draw a triangle on that curved surface. And if we want to know the total angle deficit of that triangle, we can draw a bunch of other triangles inside of it that might be easier to calculate, and then we can add all of them up. So this is kind of like what you do in calculus, right? In calculus, you're summing up rectangles, right? Riemannian sums of rectangles. Here, we're going to hear you sum triangles, okay? And this is very rem reminiscent of things you'll see in um, general relativity as well, like uh, uh, Ricci calculus is very, very... At the, this is one of the core principles behind a Ricci calculus when you try to uh, divvy up space-time, if you will, a curved space-time. But anyways, this is what I got for you right now. Uh, I hope you guys like this kind of content. Make sure to hit that like and subscribe button. Again, make sure to go onto my Patreon page if you want exclusive content or early content. And with that being said, I will see you guys in the next one.